remain standing a moment while we bow our heads uh, before the Lord and offer prayer. While we have our heads bowed, I wonder how many in here would like to be remembered in prayer before God. Just raise your hand in your request. Let's pray. Gracious and holy Father, God, we humbly come into thy presence with thanksgiving on our hearts. Because that you so loved us that you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth should not perish but have eternal life. Oh God, those who have received this great blessing of promise, how thankful we are, our Lord. And our hearts are burning for others to receive this joy unspeakable and full of glory that's been given to the human race. There are those that are sick and needy tonight, Father. Laying here afflicted and smitten and stricken and caught at the sick world. But thou didst make a provision for us, Lord. For it is written, he was rooted for our transgressions, and with his stripes we were healed. Our Father, we are just his servants. We are trying to give the people thy word. And if they might and understand. And we know that all things are possible to them that believe and make it so real to the congregation tonight that there will not be a feeble one in our midst in the service of the Lord. Not be one sinner, all be saved, inside and out. May the cock be empty, the wheelchair is lifted up. Every person with heart trouble, cancer, dying, May it all be a jubilee time over the city and around about through the valley. Start an old-fashioned revival of us sweep up and down the coast, Lord, because of your presence tonight. Establish our hearts and our faith on thee, for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And if you see it. I deem this one a great privilege to be here in this uh, auditorium at the fairgrounds tonight. And I was sorry that last night how we had to rush and hurry right through because of the alert of the army, and we did not get to even get a foundation. You know, our great adversary, the devil, uh, if he can't touch us in one way, he'll find another. If he can get all the people in one accord, then he has sent by the gas, so then he'll do something else that's just to mean in some other way. So that we can not exactly be quiet and listen and watch and believe and then see the works of the Lord. So I'm grateful for this auditorium tonight. It's all to see hundreds of people standing, and we are. Just, I'm sure the association is doing all that they know how to do to make room for people to, to be seated. And I, I believe that this keeps up like this, it deserves a try over, don't you think so, folks? To try it again when I maybe can, we can get a tent and put it out here somewhere and see 20, 30,000 people in this leader state for three or four weeks and we really get acquainted and know one another. So, and if the Lord be willing, that's what we you give me the welcome, and I appreciate that. If that be the will of the Lord, I, I always want to follow his leading, just where he goes, leading to where we know we're right. I tell you why. If you run into trouble somewhere, and then if you're not sure of your leading, then Satan can say, well, yeah, here it is. But if you know your Lord, you can lean right back again and say, I come in the name of the Lord. So just move back, that's all. And you have to do it with the Lord's thing. All in the foreign fields and go over there where we have so much of witch doctors and things to continue with. But when you know that you are led to do it, the Holy Spirit directs you to do it, and the opposition is nothing new. And you stay right on the ground, you stay right there and move on until victory comes. And so tonight, I trust that I won't keep you too long. I, uh, and a little scripture reading, and then I, we're going to have an awful time getting a prayer on it. Yeah, I see it. 
both those parts of them, and that all who have these prayer cards hold them. I'll tell you, under these circumstances, since I come to the outside, and a young fellow told me, he said, Brother Brennan, they're just passing you, some of those other places that we end up the room. I said, well, the only way I can really, I'm here for one purpose, for the glory of God at first, and for the salvation of souls, second, and to try to see the state, you know, first. So that's, and I never come to take the doctor's patient, no, I come to pray for the doctor's patient, the pastor's member, my friend, and just pray for them. And now, I thought maybe we would do this Sunday with an afternoon service. That's where it'll be warm and the people won't mind maybe standing back in their outside. But if tonight and tomorrow night, if we can bring the, by the grace of God, through the word of God, the realization of the presence of God, see? Then when we start the real prayer line, line up the hundreds or whatever it is to be prayed for, I'll be done with the result. In other words, it's building, like a minister building his text around a certain subject and then learning an all his material and driving it down, a carpenter, sitting his board, then nailing it on. And that's what we want to try to do because he has no reason to be here. He just wasn't trying to do something to help people. That's why we're here. I, if, if you, if this young man laying here on this stretcher, that precious little darling sitting on the wheelchair, little cop, this whole mother laying here on the stretcher, that lady sitting there on the chair, something, some man out there dying with heart trouble, some mother who needed up with cancer. Well, if I could do anything to help them, I, I would not be a, an excuse for a minister if I could do something and, and wouldn't do it. I don't have no place back here for me if I would do that way. If I could, I say this is some thing, but if I could take a, a quarrel and push it with my nose in this city to heal somebody, I'd do it. I would do it. I know what I mean to be sick. I've been sick myself. And then here I found where the doctor said that I could never be there and never live, and then found something that I live that I want to tell everybody else about it, you see. And I'm then trying to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit the way he would set it, just where he could get the very best results in this little short time that we have. Now, it really takes longer to stay in the meeting and what we're doing here, because many times people rush in and doesn't understand when they go out and, and the first little uh, out-of-the-way feeling they have, no matter how much you try to tell people, they they are still rely on their feeling. They, it's just one of those senses that they operate, that if I feel better, I believe it, see? But that has nothing to do with it. And if we can be there long enough in the meeting with the people to let them see what the reality of it is and how to stay with God, then you get the good results when you do that. So now I trust that you'll linger with me and know that I'm in my room praying and seeking God every hour that I can to try to do what I can for the kingdom of God and for you while I'm here with you. Um, now, now, tomorrow night, remember, and then uh, uh, if, if your prayer cards are not called, hold them. We are obligated to pray for the sick people with your prayer cards to. So we, we're morally obligated to do that, and we'll do it for the grace of God and everybody, if we possibly can. That's the, the most now, if we could be here several, maybe two or three weeks, so we could just start to do so many and so many, we finally dig right to it. Uh, but if, if we are going to try not to give out too many prayer cards, we just as many as we can think we have ample time to take up. Take up as many through the night as we can. Now, I was going to say something last night. This sounds strange in another city. I put my seats into a cleaner to be pressed. And I've lived out of a suitcase for about 15 years now. I suits wrinkle up, and I had to put my two suits down to be fresh. And, and then a little lady that paid for that press job, and here I thank you, sister. I went in and wouldn't let me pay for it. I said two sisters of that had paid for it, and the lady said, they come rubbing the suit. Oh, that's real sweet. I, I appreciate that. That's 
real nice. Of course, uh, there, there is je- it's just a suit of clothes, but uh, our trust that if something you wanted, God will honor your faith, you see, by, by doing so, see. But it's just a suit. So I appreciate your, your faith and belief that I'd be telling you at least, just telling you the truth, to be honest with you. And um, thank you very kindly. I said to ladies, let me give them the money. Said no, said no, said they, they wouldn't stand for that. So if you're here, thank you. It's a star from here down at the, uh, it's the city where we just come from. Now, I'll uh, start on tonight a subject of a testimony meeting out of the Bible. And I want to read for a text out of St. Matthew, the 14th chapter, the 27th verse. And straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Do the good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Now I want to take a subject for this testimony meeting of be not afraid. There's two elements that control the entire human race and the world. One of them is fear, the other is faith. You see, the fear or faith controls every nation, every uh, denomination, and every individual. You either fear or faith that controls it. Now, it must have been about the setting of the sun. The sun was going down and the little boat was stuck on the bank because the disciples had climbed the board and the big strong man, which we believe to be Simon, the uh, fisherman, well acquainted with boats in the lake because his occupation was to fish. And now, as he began to take these big brown arms and backs and pushing the little boat off the bank, climb the board, sat down by the side of his brother Andrew and picked up his oars. <coughs> and one day, the boats were either propelled by the, the oiling or blown by a sail. And I believe that sometimes the oil, if they had a strong wind, they could also run up a sail. And it, it must have been about a crowd about us just and on the bank, waiting or, I mean, congested like this, but perhaps many times this many, I think it's about 5,000, and they were standing on the bank waiting. They were doing these uh, servants of Christ farewell. Now, I believe if we make this story form so that you'll see that I'm not getting out of the scripture. The scriptures is what we believe in. And when God has made a promise, then God must stay with his promise. We cannot leave the promise and remain God. Perhaps they all out a few hundred yards and they make a stroke or two with the two-handed oar. And as they had to do it on Polly and Team West, pulling the little ship as he stayed along, cutting the water in the quiet Galilee, the sea as the calm was up on the sea at the sundown. And on the shore, the people were waiting, asking them to come back again, visit them. And as the last one dimmed out, the last farewell, the disciples must have rode pretty heavy then, knowing they had quite a, a tussle across that sea through the night, to be over on the other side. As it got just about dark, so they couldn't see the people anymore, it must have been the young John that stopped oaring and maybe not as used to the oaring as the rest of the hardened mm. seaman was. Stop, brush the hair back from his face, and, and taking a little breath, a little time to breathe. They kind of catch it, their breath from oaring so hard, trying to get a, as much across as he could before it got dark. I imagine they started a testimony meeting, and young John must have said something like this. My brethren, after today, I don't believe there could be any of us ever think that we're a fallen or deceiver. 
I believe in my way of thinking, he proved himself today to be exactly what we expected him to be. Say, did you, brethren, notice today when that crowd of hungry people that are thronged around him to hear the word of God and to see how they pressed and pushed to get around and some of them hadn't eaten all day and those mothers, how pale they looked with their little babies and nursing and so forth and the sick pressing around. But when he asked for that fishes, and I've seen that little boy and he brought that little five little biscuits or two little pieces of fish up there and he set them all down about fifties up on the grassy hillside and I myself wondered what he was going to do when he just had one little lunch that some little boy perhaps playing truant from school run off and he heard the crowd and he went up on the hill to see what was taking place and it's so fascinating he just forgot about his lunch. He wanted to see what this great speaker was saying. Watch what he was doing. And when I noticed him take that bread, them little pieces of biscuit, hold them up and bless them. When I seen him break that bread and put it over into the hands of we brethren and reach back off of that same biscuit and get another piece of biscuit. And when he reached back again, there was another piece of biscuit. Already grown and baked and seasoned and ready for eating. You know what, brother? He might have said something like this. It reminded me of the Bible stories that I used to hear my mother tell me about. When I was a little Jewish boy, I remember my uh, pretty little mother and how she used to tell me, Honey, when our people came up out of Egypt, we were slaves one time. And when we had a great prophet rise up among us, Moses, who God sent to us, to help us be delivered from our afflictions of the bondage. And Moses, of course, could not make bread. But when we had two and a half million people out in the wilderness where there was no wheat or nothing to make bread out of, Jehovah rained bread down out of the heavens for us. And I used to wonder, I'd say, Mother... Has Jehovah got a big bunch of angels up there and a big lot of ovens that he bakes this bread? Where did he get this bread at, Mama? Or could we look up in the skies and see the fires from his oven each night when they were baking it? Mother would probably have said something like this. No, son. You're too young to understand. Jehovah don't have to have ovens. Jehovah's a creator. He just creates the bread and it falls down to the earth. Young John, when he was standing up in the boat testifying to the brethren, confessing his supreme faith in Jesus, that he must have been some connection with Jehovah. Because he created bread like Jehovah did. Though to me, he truly is the Messiah. Because he's the son of God, he, he can create and make bread and, and do just as Jehovah did. So that settled it with me. When I seen him break that bread and those fishes, that not only just raw fish, but it was cooked fish, ready to eat. I like to ask my listening audience tonight, what kind of an Adam did he turn loose then? When he had cooked fish and, and cooked bread and took five biscuits and two little fishes and fed 5,000 people and took a basket full left over. What did he do? What would science say about that today? What kind of an Adam or 
molecule or whatever they want to call it that let loose sand. But he did it. And little John was convinced that the Bible stories that Mother told him about Jehovah, that same Jehovah was manifested in a man called the Lord Jesus Christ. Because no one else could have done it. He was a creator. Well, Simon, you know how he is. He's always ready to testify. And just like any other normal Christian who really knows God, knows the Lord Jesus, is ready to give his testimony right quick. And as we spoke something about him last night, I might rehearse his testimony. He said, Well, brethren, when I used to sing this sea here with my father years ago, and I know you all knew my dear old Pharisee father, I was uh, a great man of church and believed in God. Always of a morning before we go to fish, we just put it on for a livelihood, so he'd have me kneel down with him and pray out here on the bank. Far fish for that day, and God never did let us down. I remember when his hair began to turn gray, and I knew soon I was going to have to depart with my old dad. One day I remember he took me, set me down on the, the rail of the boat, and said, Simon, my boy, I want you to remember this. All Israel has looked for the coming of the Messiah. And as the time draws near, each man has always thought he'd live to see the day he would come. And I thought the same, but I'm getting old now, and I suppose I won't get to see it. But Simon, as a Bible believer, as a believer in Jehovah, I want to instruct you, my son. That's a good thing for a dad to do, or a mother. wonder if today, if we put more time on instructing our children in the things of the Lord than we do about hot rods and other things, we wouldn't have so much juvenile delinquency. It is true. Suzanne Wesley was a mother of 17 children. She didn't have no push-button dishwashers and, and tickets to turn on to get water. And yet with all those children, she could spend two to three hours a day in prayer around those 17 children. From that little nest of little birds came forth a John and a Charles who stirred the world. We need more mothers like that with time to teach your children about God. I stood by a grave not long ago in London when I was there to pray for the king. And standing there with my hand on her grave, I said, God, rest that precious mother. I know you have. And there, very close to her, of course, is the Bunyan and the Pilgrim Progress and so forth and William Capper. Then over in the churchyard, John lay the remains of his body into the dust. Then Simon said, Dad has told me many times, Now, Simon, son, just before the coming of the Messiah, there's going to be a great stir among the people, and the enemy will put out a, a many a false thing, calling it Messiah. And I want you to remember, Simon, my boy, that the true Messiah, what he'll be, and what he'll look like, and what he'll be like. The true Messiah will be according to the Bible, to what our prophets have told us. Moses said, The Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like unto me. And he must have reached over and touched Andrew. He said, Andrew went first to hear him. I couldn't believe it when that, what John was down there preaching, predicting there's coming in the Messiah. To me, it was just another go on. But one day, Andrew come told me that I should come see this man at least. Listen to him once. And I had in my heart what Father told me and what the Scriptures had said that this Messiah would be a God prophet. And when I walked up into the audience with uh, my brother Andrew, quickly he turned and looked right at me in all that crowd. Must have been that he knew that I was thirsty. God usually 
comes to those who are thirsting and really wanting to get a hold of him. Desperately. And he must have looked at me when he did. He said, Your name is Simon and you're the son of Jonas. That settled it with me. For I knew that my father told me that the scripture said that the Messiah would be a prophet. And this man not only knew me by name, who had never seen me, but he knew my father also. Told me I was the son of Jonas. That settled it. Philip, he must have touched the floor about that time. Now these are Christ's own disciples that we're having a testimony to not the outside world, those who live with him and sleep with him and dwell with him and, and knows what he is. Heard him talk and speak. Philip said, Simon, that convinced me also because I've read the scriptures all my life and been taught them and I knew as a Jew that we're taught to believe our prophets and the prophecy truly said that the Messiah, the Son of God, would be a prophet like Moses. When I seen the sign of the prophet done, and I knew that was Messiah, because it had been hundreds of years since we've had a prophet. I think around some 400 years since Malachi. And I knew that that was the next thing to appear was a Messiah. And that was him. So I run around the hill to my friend Philip as we took him last evening. And found him, uh, Philip, uh, found Nathaniel rather under the tree, uh, praying, and said, Come see who we found, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He said, Could there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? He said, Come see. Come find out for yourself. And as he come around the hill, he told him what had been happening, saying, You know, Messiah will be a prophet. We know that. Oh, yes, said Nathaniel. I know it will be a, he'll be a prophet. Well, I've seen him do those very things without a shadow of doubt. I know it. I've seen it. I've tested it. And I know it's true. Well, I'll just come see them. Round the hill they went. When they got into the presence of the Lord Jesus, he looked down to Nathaniel and said, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. When he come into the line, and he said, how did you know me, Rabbi? Teacher, you've never seen me in your life. How did you ever know me? He said, before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. Now that's what the scripture says. Philip, being a Bible student, that knows that that was what the Messiah was to be like. He said, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. And Jesus said, uh, Well, uh, because I told you that, you believe, you'll see greater things than this. If you just believe that much, you'll see greater than that. First, you've got to believe it. Now, I met it. It must have been young James or one of them sitting there. I said, You know, one day we all know Rebecca. That's the wife of the businessman of Jericho. Zacchaeus, he runs a tax outfit down there, collects taxes. And we know that Sister Rebecca had prayed so hard for Zacchaeus to, to receive Jesus and told him all the things that, that she'd seen, but the rabbi had told him that he was nothing to him because he wasn't recognized among the clergy of that day. So he would not accept him. So, Zacchaeus, you remember his testimony at the full gospel businessman's breakfast that morning when he come in and told us uh, about what happened? He said he got down there to see Jesus and there was too much of a crowd. And somehow or another, where Christ is, it's just, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. All of those that's drawable. All the Father has given me will come to me. And he said, Zach is seen that him being small in statue as he testified. Uh, he could not get to see the master. 
So uh, he runs down to another corner, knowing which way he was going to the city. And he climbed up in a sycamore tree, and he, he said, Now, I'll just sit up here on these where two limbs meet. That's a good place to sit. Where two ways meet. That's your ideas and God's Word. Where your ideas and His meet, that's a good place to rest just for a few minutes. Decide on which way you're going from there. And he sat down. And he said, I remember that my wife told me about this year Galilean being a prophet. Now, if he is a prophet, I'm going to believe him because I know that our Bible said, if there be one among you who is a prophet, and I, the Lord, will make myself known to him, and what he says comes to pass, and hear him, I'm with him, but if it doesn't, then don't hear him. So I, I know and do not believe, as my rabbis told me, that a man that was born as poor as he was and with a name like he's got and was not raised up to be a rabbi and all this other supernatural stuff he talks about, I, I don't believe it. So I'm, I'm going to wait and when I see him, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. So as he got to thinking about what Rebecca told him, well, maybe he is a prophet. But if he is, I'll just get my opinion, then I'll go back and tell Rebecca, because he's too many. So he got up on the limbs and pulled all the leaves around him, covered himself up so he couldn't be seen, camouflaged himself. After a while, they heard a noise coming around the bend. There's something strange. Where Jesus is, is usually a noise of some sort. I don't know why, but it's always just like Aaron going in with the pomegranate and the bell. He, don't make a lot of noise while they didn't know he was living. And I think that's what's matter the church today. It's got so dead we don't hear nothing no more. So uh, where there's life, there's noise. Now, and we find out that he said then when Jesus came around the corner and he got to look at him, he had fixed himself a little camouflage so Jesus couldn't see him, so he had a leaf. He just pulled his leaf down and looked out. Because he didn't want to see him, a businessman of the city, setting up in a tree. That would be kind of embarrassing, you know. And this holy roller coming in, anyhow, you know, a name that he had, that would hurt his business if, uh, if uh, they seen him associating himself with a fellow like that. And so, but he wanted to find out what Rebecca had been talking about. So he sat up there, he kept his leaf up and said, I hear a noise, so maybe after a while he'll come along. He heard the noise, he looked around the corner, there come the great, big, burly fishermen saying, uh, folks, I'm sorry, our, our brother is very tired, he, he's, uh, he's on his road out now, he's got to go to Jerusalem. He said, would you all just stand aside and give him room to get out very, uh, with a lot of diplomacy and kindness, other disciples following along, saying, folks, I wish we had time, but we just haven't. And um, after a while, when he turned the corner, then Zacchaeus turned down his leaf and began to look, see him coming along like that. And you know, I don't believe that any man could look right at Christ and ever feel the same again. I don't believe he could. Something began to touch him and saying, you know what? I, I just, maybe Rebecca was right. But I'll get a good look at him and then I'll hear him sometimes. Because he doesn't know me, I'm a businessman here, and he just entered the city, so he doesn't know me. Doesn't know nothing about me, and he doesn't know my condition, so I just set up here in the tree. And he's come along, and when he crossed over the sidewalk, come down, got right out of the tree, he stood and looked up. Said, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going home with you today for dinner. Oh, you remember, said James, that settled it with me. I knew that he was that prophet that Moses spoke of, because we had just entered the city. How did he know he was up in the tree, and how did he know his name was Zacchaeus and all about him? That settled it to me, because the Bible said that he would be a prophet. Well, then another one spoke up and said, what about blind Bartimaeus when we went out of the city? When there he was setting out that dreaming of the days, he said, when he had his sight, his mother told him about the great day of Jehovah once 
spoke for the people, but he'd been blind all these years. And how, when we came out of the city, the people making fun of him and the priest hollering, You raise the dead! We got a graveyard full of them up here! Come up and raise them up! See, God don't clown for people. Jesus just does as the Father shows him, and that's all he does, he says. St. John 5. You know, they still have them evil spirits in the world today, oh. They'll say, let me see him heal this one. Let me see him heal that one. See, that's the same evil spirit. They just don't know. The same one set up there on the cross. Uh, before he got to the cross, when he was tempted, he said, up there said, if thou be the Son of God, perform a miracle here before me and turn these stones into bread and eat, and I'll believe you. See? Jesus said, but it's written, man shall not live by bread alone. He didn't clown for Satan. And when they had him in the courtyard, put a rag over his face, wrapped it around his eyes, and took a stick and hit his precious head, said, if you're a prophet now and can tell us if you're that Messiah prophet, tell us who hit you on the head. He never said a word. See, the powers and the gifts of God are not to show off with. They're to serve God. They're for the glory of God. To do something to help somebody. Not to come out like a stuffed shirt and say, me, my great, that's not it. When a man does that, he's little in my sight. Who is great? One, God. Then it might have been then immediately at that that Andrew might have said this. But brethren, remember the time when he sent us into the city? He told us that morning he was going down to Jericho, but had need go by Jerusalem or go by Samaria. From Jerusalem up around Samaria and then to Jericho. Remember how tired he was all day we said, Why why don't you take me? Why don't you do? He said, Y'all wait here and you go in and get yourself food. Now, while we were gone and we got the food to return, you remember we come up and we found out when we had gotten there there was a woman on her road up. And there he was alone with a a woman of an ill ill condition. She was a foul woman. A woman that we call today of the street uh, red light lady. She had uh, her marriages was all mixed up. And she was living with man without being married to them. Very foul person. Them days they wore a garment that had to prove them. So when We've seen come up, you remember we slipped in behind that bush, that little wall, and see what he would say? That's what settled it with every one of us. He asked the woman to bring him a drink, and she said, we've got segregation here. We, we don't, it's not customary for you Jews to ask we Samaritan women such a thing as that. He said, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. I'll give you water that you don't come here to draw. Remember how the conversation went on? What was he doing? The Father, he said, in St. John 5, 19. And listen to this, brothers and sisters. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, never took credit for healing anybody. He said, it's not me that doeth the work. It's my Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the work. Then notice what's taking place. In St. John 5, 19, he said this. He went to a pool of Bethesda. There lay great multitude, many more people around this place tonight, of lame, blind, halt, withered, crippled. Now the scripture says that. Lame, halt, blind, withered. And here he comes. Just a few days before that woman had touched his garment and was made whole. Here he comes, garments full of virtue, walking, passed by the mother with the waterhead baby. Passed by the blind man. And if you've ever taken the history of it, there's an angel come down and trouble the water. You know what trouble waters are. Current going one way and 
wind's blowing it another way, it's a dangerous water. And they believed it was an angel. And everyone who's stepping into the water had enough faith to stop that moving of the water. And they got well of what disease they had. And they laid there for the multitude. Many of them didn't believe that. But those who believed it, it was healing for them. God's always had a way of healing his people. So those stepping in first, and I've read books on it where they said that they'd even stab one another, trying to rush in and get in there first. So as soon as the first one stepped in with enough faith to pull the virtue of the angel away, then he didn't come back maybe for a month or two, another season. And they laid there constantly waiting. What patience. And Jesus walked right around them, blind, deaf, lame, halt, withered, never said a thing. Till he come to a man laying on a pallet. How many of you Californians know what a pallet is? Or what part of Kentucky did you come from? I was raised on one. Just lay something down on the floor and lay down. Laying on a pallet. He might have had a prostrate trouble. He might have had uh, he might have had TV. Whatever it was, he had it 38 years. It was retired, and it wasn't going to kill him. He could walk. And Jesus knowing what? Jesus knowing that he had been in this condition all this time. He said, "Will thou be made whole? Why not the blind man? Why not the crippled man?" But see, he was directed. Now, watch his answer. And he said, I have no one to pump me in the water. While I'm coming, somebody in better shape than me outruns me and gets in there, see? Gets in heaven. He can walk. He could go. But there's some that couldn't walk. See? And we say, he had compassion. Human sympathy is not compassion. Nor the will of God is compassion. So, he said, will thou be made whole? He said, I have no one to pump me in the water while I'm coming. Someone steps ahead of me. He said, take up thy bed and go into thy house. He never questioned one more thing. For Jesus knew he wouldn't question. Picked it up, put it on his back, and went on. Jesus is questioned about it. Let him do the same thing today, and he'll be questioned about it. Someone will say, here's old brother so-and-so. He's a good old man, wrong church all his life, selling pencils on the corner. Make him whole. Why would you pass him by? Watch Jesus put the answer to him the same day when they caught him. Asked him the question, St. John 5, 19. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing. How many know that the Scripture? The Scriptures, the scriptures can fail. So Jesus could only do what God showed him in a vision to do. And that made him a prophet. More than a prophet, he was a God prophet. He was a God of the prophets. Some people today try to take divinity away from him. His sign as Messiah was a prophet sign. But in redemption, he was God. The Virgin Mary, a woman, virgin, no old man. The Holy Spirit overshadowed her and created a blood cell. That blood cell brought forth the Son of God. He neither was Jew nor Gentile. He was God. We are saved, says the Bible, by the blood of God. The blood comes from the male sex. The hemoglobin comes out of the male sex. You people, here's springtime out here. I'm watching today a little bird up in the bush making himself a nest. Oh, they'll make him a nest. Well, that old mother bird can get on that nest and lay a whole nest full of eggs. If she hasn't been with the mate, they won't hatch. Right? She might set on them and be so loyal, turn them eggs just as loyal, and starve herself to death that she's so poor she can't fly off the nest. If she hasn't been with the mate, they won't hatch. They haven't got no blood cell in them. The life comes from the blood. Life is in the blood. It's like churches today. You can, we got the biggest churches we ever had. Most members we ever had. Best dress we ever had. Best fed we ever had. More money than we ever had. More sickness than we ever had. Because we got more unbelief than we ever had. It's just, there's only one thing to do. Them eggs lay right down that nest, nest and rot. 
And so will church members if they haven't been with the mate, Jesus Christ. It's time to clean the nest and get back in there somebody that's got faith and been filled with the Holy Ghost. Got living faith and a living God. Been with the mate, Christ Jesus. Something that will hatch, something that will bring forth life. Sure, Jesus could only do, he said, and the scriptures are infallible. He said, I do nothing within myself until I see the Father doing it first. Now, he said he saw it. See. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself. But what he sees the Father. Look back to the emphatic diagram. See if the word isn't right. See. Look at it. Even to the Douay version, all the versions give it the same way. So I see the Father do it. The Father worketh. What the Father does, He shows me, and I just go and act it out for Him. That's what every prophet of the Bible done. Was to see by vision what to do. And that was the sign of the Messiah in that day. And if that's the sign of the Messiah in that day, at the closing of the Jewish dispensation, and he promised he'd do the same thing in the last days, it's time we did arrive. We're at the last day. The world's in a nervous prostration. She's ready to be blown to pieces because they have rejected, denied, and the Holy Spirit has wounded their hearts, and God, like a, a lady in a ten cent store here, a few weeks ago in Louisville, Kentucky. She had a little boy. And she was going around showing him things. saying, look, dear, look, dear, look, dear. And the little boy just sat and stared. And she, after a while, she just fell over on the counter and began screaming. And some of the people in the 10 cent store went to her and said, what's the matter? She said, it's my little boy. She said, it can't be so. The doctor said he was better, but he isn't. Said, a few months ago, the little fellow just started staring. And said, I can't get his attention to nothing. He said, everything that a, a little boy his age ought to look at, said, I'll shake it before him, and he'll just sit and stare. You know, the church, the Pentecostal church, has got somewhat the same way. God shut everything in the Bible before him. And they still just sit and stare. There's something wrong. It's time to arise and wake and call on God. Remember, God predicted in his Bible that this would be the lady I'll see in church age when things would take place this way. Now, let's believe him. As Andrew goes on with the story just for a moment, a few longer. Andrew said, you know, he told the woman. Now, she was a Samaritan. There's only, as I said last night, there's only three races of people on earth, Ham, Sham, and Japheth's people. If we believe the Bible, he all sprung from them two and three sons. That's Jew, Gentile, and Samaritan. Remember Peter was given the keys to the kingdom? Or did he open it up at Pentecost to the Jews? Went down to Samaria, although Philip had went down and preached to them the baptism of the Holy Ghost and baptized them, and, and they were ready to receive it. But Peter had the keys. Come down, laid hands on, they received the Holy Ghost. Then at the house of Cornelius, the Gentiles, Acts 10, 49, we find out that Peter was sent by a vision up, and while he yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them. From that time on, the Holy Ghost is just to whosoever will, let him come. But he had the key to the kingdom. Now, notice, them three races. Now, as I said last evening, I had to hurry. The reason I'm repeating this in another way tonight. I had to hurry, and you were nervous, and uh, they were telling us alert, and so forth. Now, it's your calmer tonight and quiet. Notice, the Jews were looking for a Messiah. And the Messiah was supposed to come and declare himself by, to be the Messiah. Now, do you think Jesus come unscripturally? He wouldn't have been Jesus. He wouldn't have been the Son of God. He had to come according to the Scripture, but not according to the thoughts of the churches of that day. He was different from the thoughts of the church, their doctrine about it, but he come according to the way the Scriptures was written. And that's what I'm trying to bring back to your memory tonight. The same thing. He comes according to the way He promised to come. 
Now remember, if God is ever called on the scene to act, and the way he acts first, he has to act every time afterwards the same way or he did wrong when he acted first. So if that was the way of making himself known in that day to the Jews and to the Samaritans who were looking for a Messiah, no Gentile was looking for a Messiah. We were Romans and Greeks and uh, worshiping gods of iron and steel and marble and like Oliver Stilton and, and uh, like that with a club on our back. But now after 2,000 years of theology and teaching, now the Gentile church, the elect church, is looking for the Messiah. Now he'll have to act when he's coming this time just like he did that time. He'll have to do the same things because the Word said he would do it. Now, so that you'll see that our Christ is not dead. He's with us, living in us. Right here with us now. And now if I can get you to see that, then it's a very easy thing for you to accept your healing. It isn't about my hands being laid on you. I'm a man. It's His hands. Find Him. Now, notice. When they listened and heard the conversations of this, now this is a, a woman of ill fame now in Samaria. She was a bad woman, so they were listening. And when they heard... He said, uh, go get your husband and come here. Now, he talked to her long enough to catch her spirit. He said, go get your husband and come here. She said, I don't have any husband. And you remember, Brother Andrew might have said to the rest of the brothers, he said, you remember how we all thought, uh-oh, uh-oh, here's one time he's called. Because he tells her that she hasn't, that she hasn't got a, a husband. He said, go get your husband and come here, brother. He said, go get your husband. He's telling her she's got a husband. And she says she hasn't got a husband. She's contradicting his word. Now what's going to happen? You remember how we all stood with our ears uh, pricked up and, and uh, the chills going over us? What's the matter? We wondered, had our master been caught in a trap? Now he tells the woman she's got a husband and she says, I haven't got a husband. Remember how we thought? Then what did he, just as cool as he could be, said, Thou hast said well, because you've had five and the one you're living with now is not your husband. The scene changed right quick. And what did this woman say to him? Sir, I am a Samaritan woman. I may be living in sin. I know there was something like this. But I know the scriptures. I come out of a home that taught the Bible. I, you must be a prophet. I know. We're taught, all Samaria's taught, that there's a Messiah coming who's day, who will be the Christ. means the anointed one. And when he comes, he'll tell us these things. That'll be the sign of the Messiah. You must be his prophet. Jesus said, I'm he. And never was a man you could say that but him. Right. And never will be. I'm he. And she left her water pot and ran into the city and said, Come see a man. Told the man in the street. Come see a man who told me what I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? If that was the sign of Messiah yesterday, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, it's the same today. He's got to be. Yes, we remembered that. How that the woman said that. And how that... The Bible said that all the city believed him to be the Messiah because the woman told the people in the city that he they never had met before in the conversation. He said, go get your husband. And she said, I have none. He said, you've got five and you men know that that's the kind of a life I've lived. And that convinced me that he was the Messiah because he knows the secret of my heart. Now, Listen, does not the Bible say that that in the beginning was the Word 
and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now to you Bible readers, does not the book of Hebrews tell us in the fourth chapter that the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the thunder of the mire of the bone, and a deserter of the thoughts of the heart? The Word. And when the living Word, which is Christ, comes into our midst, Is not it it's still a discerner of the thoughts of the heart? The living word. Christ, the living word. He is the word. And he's the living word. This is the letter word. And when the letter word is brought with the living word, it's sharper than a two-edged sword and a discerner of the thoughts of the heart. Jesus looked upon his audience and perceived their thoughts. Some of them stood by and said, he's a fortune teller. He's the elder of a devil. Jesus said, I forgive you for that, calling the Spirit of God an evil thing, an evil work. I forgive you for that, but someday the Holy Spirit's coming. And you speak one word against that, it'll never be forgiven you. In this world and the world to come. Then what is, what is black seen of the Holy Ghost? See? Call the Spirit of God an unclean thing. It's blasphemy. That's what blasphemy is. Call the Spirit of God an evil spirit. So you see, when the people shouted and spoke in tongues and so forth, and this nation had constantly called them a bunch of holy wars and holy things and everything else, you see why she's ready for judgment? Now the Bible said, now you can cost the people. The Bible said, if you have a gift that's speaking in tongues, then when the unlearned comes in and, and the first thing you know, you all speak with tongues, you'll say, you're all mad. But if there be one among you, that's the prophet, that will reveal the secrets of the heart, then they'll fall down and say, truly God's with you. Well, if you believe in speaking in tongues, don't you know what the furtherment of it is? Don't you know what a higher blessing is? Don't you see the Holy Spirit? What makes you speak with tongues? Do you do that yourself? No, sir. The Holy Ghost does it. If you're sincere, is that right? The Holy Ghost does it. That's the same thing that set in the church. First apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists. The Holy Spirit. The living Christ. That's not dead, but alive forevermore. We have the picture of it down here where it was been taken. It's taken over here in California here recently. Taken George J. Lace to the FBI, examined it and so forth. You've seen it and everything. A pillar of fire. Same pillar of fire. It's stuck in Germany, Switzerland, all over the world where it's been taken. Now, what is it? Is that how many knows that Jesus Christ was that pillar of fire? Well, when he was, uh, he, uh, St. John 6, when he was being questioned, he said, about, he said, Abraham, about his days. He said, well, now, I said, you mean that you uh, seen Abraham and you're a man over 50 years old? He said, before Abraham was, I am. That he was that pillar of fire, the angel of the covenant. In other words, the Lord God that went out of God. He was the pillar of fire that led the children of Israel through the wilderness. And that pillar of fire, the Lord God, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And he said, I come from God and go to God. And after his death, burial, and resurrection, Saul, he met Saul on the road down to Damascus and struck him down with a light. Now the rest of them saw it, but Saul saw it. I came out of the wilderness, bringing the children of Israel, and come dwell in a man, fullness of the Godhead bodily, and perform these kind of signs as the Messiah, and if that same pillar of fire, that same Jesus, that same Spirit, comes back into His church, universal, won't it do the same thing? Yeah. He doesn't leave upon me the words that I do, so He do also. Yet a little while in the world seeth me no more, He said, Yet ye shall see me, for I, I, will be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. You see what I'm trying to do, friends, is let you know that the Jesus that made the promise in the Bible is right here with you. Right here now. Now, 
And if you'd walk up to him and he had on this suit that he gave me, and he would say, uh, you say, Jesus, will you heal me? You know what he would say to you? Well, my child, I did that. He can't do it again. If you're redeemed out of the pawn shop, how can he be redeemed the second time? He brought you out. He was wounded for your transgressions. And with his stripes, you were healed. See what I mean? Your healing's already completed. Your salvation's completed. The only thing you have to do is just receive it. What does it make any difference who lays hands on you? What does this, that, or the other? Oh, where are you at? Just believe it. That's all receive it. If God has to give it to you. That's the reason that I don't take too much time. The American people are taught the old Jewish custom of laying on of hands, which is all right. But that wasn't a Gentile way. Well, Jeremiah said, come lay your hand on my daughter and she'll live, the Jew. But the Romans said, I'm not worthy that you come under my roof. Just speak the word. See, he said, I'm a man under authority. I'll say to this man, come, he comes, and let him go, he goes. He goes to everything under him is a century. Century of man, which means a hundred. That hundred man was under him. What he said they had to do. What did he recognize in Jesus Christ? That all sickness and diseases was under him. Under his control. Just speak the word. Amen. There you are. You don't need your hands laid up. And what did Jesus say? He turned around and said, I never found faith like this in Israel. Amen. Well, that's the kind of faith we want here in California. Amen. That kind of faith. Speak the word. That's all it needs. Not some man say, well, Lord, if God tell you so and so laid hands on me, I felt something go through me. You might have felt his hands laying on you, but you're a felt man. <laughs> See? Jesus never did say, did you feel it? He said, did you believe it? That's a, if you believe it. It's a feeling, not a feeling affair. It's a believing affair. He that believer. Right where you are. I don't say you don't feel something. I know I felt some strange feelings. <laughs> but I never did rest my faith upon a feeling. I can't build my doctrine upon a sensation. I've got to build it up on God. Say it's the Lord by the word of God. And that's your reason tonight. And then if it's built up on that word, and there's enough faith in that to make that word be made manifest, Jesus died and gave his life that he might sanctify a church that he could be universally around the world all the time in his church. This Holy Spirit, when Jesus was God made flesh, the fullness of God was in him. He had the Spirit without nature. We had it by nature. Now, what if you go out there and pick up a spoonful of, of uh, water out of the ocean? Well, that, that's what Jesus had, the whole ocean. But you and I have got a spoonful. That's the difference. You never miss it. You don't have to have us, but we have to have him. But if you took that spoonful of water and took it down to the laboratory, the same chemicals that's in the entire ocean is in that spoonful. And with God on the day of Pentecost, when he's come down like a Russian wind. Did you notice? He was a pillar of fire. But uh, did you notice he separated himself from that pillar of fire? Divided himself amongst his people. And cloven tongues of fire set upon each of them. God separated himself to his church. Oh, yeah. Lord, he said, well, the two and three are coming in my name. I'll see you there, man. Two will agree upon anything. And that's so I'll give it to you. What is that? When the little fire here and the little fire here, each one of you is a part of God. When we come together, it's the body of Christ uniting. God separating himself, giving part to me and part to you and part to the next fellow so we can all live and have eternal life. And now, that eternal life comes from the word, the Greek word is, I said, Zoe, which means God's own life. Now, it must have been while we were testifying of this. But all at once, Andrew must have sat down, and Satan must have looked back over through the dark clouds. I'm closing now. And he saw them gone off without Jesus. That's just as good as he wanted. And now, my brothers, my sisters, Let's just look now, right straight in the face. They had gone off without Jesus. 
I believe that that's what's happened to the church to make up this lady a see a church age. The church has gone off without Jesus. We've gone off on great tantrums. We've gone off to a place where we've got a big building program. See who can build the biggest church. We've gone off on educational programs. We've gone off on denominational programs. We've gone off on all kinds of programs. And what have we had stopped? We've had out a bunch of denominational children. That's right. We're building, we're building our, our, our things upon our, our denomination. Don't associate with them over there. Don't have this over here. We're the denomination. we got all the truth. Remember, brother, the blanket stretched all ways. See? It goes over the other fellow, too. But we draw boundaries and separated ourselves, just like the Baptists, Methodists, and the rest of them did. You used to talk about the cold form of Baptists, now it's the cold form of Pentecostals. See? Baptists are warming up. Notice how now it's true, we have passed out denominational children. We've had out educational children. We've had foreign Bible schools. Perfectly all right. But what do we went there? Told them, give them the Bachelor of Art and the PhD and the LLD and even some of our great denominations before they sent a missionary, a Pentecostal now. Before they sent a Pentecostal missionary overseas, he has to be examined by a psychiatrist to see if his IQ is high enough. That is a stain on the name of Pentecost. Pentecost is not an organization. Pentecost is an experience. That all people can have Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, or what more. Who is to decide who is the missionary now? The Holy Ghost or some worldly psychiatrist? God gives the call. Peter's education wouldn't have qualified with that. The Bible said he is both ignorant and unlearned. But the Holy Ghost that pleased the Holy Ghost to make him the head of the church. In John, both ignorant and unlearned. But that's where we are. The devil saw us go off on a big tantrum like this. And he says, here's my opportunity. That's the same thing he done now. So he raised up over the mountains and began to blow his poison breath. He said, there they are. Huddle out down in the middle of that sea. They're testifying of what has been. Now I see they haven't got him anymore now. He's not with them no more now. And what's the lady of seeing church age? Of all the church ages, seven or eight church ages, the lady of seeing Jesus is on the outside of his own church knocking, trying to get back in. Now, that's where we've come to. And so Satan has been blowing his poison breath around, you know, saying, Days of is past. There's no such a thing as that. Don't you believe that kind of stuff? It's mental telepathy. It's not. They're leaving the Word. Uh, uh, you just examine the Word and see if it isn't right. They see if God does get in that Word and confirm it. Then it makes it right. When God says so. That settles it. Now, days of miracles is past. Got formal. We'll just talk about our churches and our, what we're going to do and our great programs we got. See, he's seen without. And the little ship begins to blow. We talk. And we find out all hopes is gone for a revival. Just about like that today. God sent old Roberts across the country. He sent a Tommy Osborne across the country. He, he sent one after the other, wave after wave after wave after wave. And still we still sit without revival. What's the matter? But remember, he hasn't gone too far. When he's seen them go off, he knew what was going to happen. And that's the reason he over here could predict the end at the beginning. He knew the lady of seeing church age is going to push him out. So he made preparations to meet it. Those who I love, I chasten and rebuke. I stand at the door and knock. If any man will uh, open, let me in. I'll come in and stuff with him. If you just open up, let him in. And when the winds are blowing, it's contrary, and we see it's hard to move. That's the way they were. But he had climbed up the highest hill that was in Galilee. Highest hill in Palestine, maybe. He was up on the mountain. Higher you go, farther you can see. And he climbed up there so he could watch over them. And when he seen them in distress, he was high enough that he could see them. 
And when he was sure was, he realized that we was coming to this condition. So he didn't only climb the mountain of Calvary, but he climbed all the past the moon and stars until he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And his eyes on the sparrow. I don't know he's watching this meeting tonight. He hasn't gone before, he's watching it. When the little ship talks about, this boy here, his little ship, yours, yours, out here all around, your little ship talks about, the doctor says I can't get well, I'm paralyzed, I got cancer, I'm going to die. He knows that. But his eyes on the sparrow, he redeemed you. He paid the price. He was waiting for your transgressions. With his stripes, you were healed. The preparation made. And he climbed up to the right of the glory and sat down at the right hand of God on high, watching over you, ever living to make intercession. The Bible said he's sending a, a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. <laughs> The same high priest that was sure on earth, the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you'd touch him, you'd act like he did when he was on earth. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. A woman touched his garment, went out and got in the crowd and sat down. She didn't get in the line. The rest of them was in the line. She didn't get in the line, so she touched his garment, went and sat down in the audience. And he turned around and said, Who touched me? And the apostle Peter rebuked him and said, Everybody's touching. Why do you say a thing like that? He said, But I got weak. Virtue gone from me, a vision. Something happened. It's a certain kind of touch. All big programs today is not touching. It takes an individual's heart to touch in. Somebody that'll believe it, lay aside your superstition and believe him. Somebody touched me, said I got weak. Virtue, strength went out of me. And you looked around over the audience until we found the little woman. Told her her blood issue she'd had. Her faith has saved you. See, thy faith has saved. Those are saved. Same words, physically or spiritual. See, thy faith has saved thee. Now, if he's the same high priest, and he's the same yesterday, today, forever, if you would touch him, how would he act? If he's the same, he'd act the same. God challenged this audience tonight to believe that story to be true. See if he isn't still the same high priest. See if he doesn't act tonight like he did when he was in Galilee. See if he doesn't do the same thing. We're not playing church. Too late the hours. The sun's setting. It's time to be realistic. It's time for men and women to throw off their, their, their church cloaks. Lay aside your denominational rags. And look to God in heaven. He comes to revive. He comes to church. Touch him and see if he's still a high priest. I challenge that to you. Believe it. See what happens. So he come walking to him on the water. The last hour. All hope's gone. What happened? As soon as they seen him, just the same as they did then, they're doing today. The only thing that could help them, they was afraid of it. They thought it was spooky. He's a spirit. And the same thing today. You Baptist, you Methodist, you Presbyterian Catholic. You Pentecostal, oneness, threeness, fatherness, sinless, four square, whatever you may be. You got children. Right. But don't be afraid. God promised he would do it. Right. If he could speak tonight, it says it was then. When they were all scared, well, said, we see a spirit. It looks spooky. There's something strange about it. That do not fear. It is I. Yeah, yeah. Oh. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Be not afraid. It's I. Won't you, church, tonight, let him in your little bark as you're sailing over life, solemn Maine? Won't you just open up your heart and say, Lord Jesus, I believe you. I'm willing. I know that scripture. The man told me what is the scripture. 
I know that the Bible says you're the same yesterday, day, and forever. I know these things. We ain't got time to get all into it tonight. We'll keep on going tomorrow night into it, on and on, see? Just keep on showing you and proving you, friends. What you have believed has been true. But we're living along the throne a little farther now. That's what's the trouble with the Christians. You know, science don't take what science said two or three hundred years ago. Um, it was the French scientist said about three hundred years ago, proved it by revolving a ball around the earth. And he said, if any person could ever go the terrific speed of 30 miles an hour, scientifically prove that gravitation take you off the earth. What about Ricky and his hot rod? <laughs> They're going around about several thousand miles an hour. You think they look back to see what that science says? No, they're still going on. They're moving on. But the church is say, let's see what Mr. Moody said about it. Let's see what Mr. Wesley said. That man lived in the age. That was all right for that age. But we got not only a scientific tree to climb, we've got untapped resources of the bountiful blessings of God, which is not limited to unlimited. Whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, I'll do it. Every promise in the book belongs to you. When you're saved, he gives you a check with his name, wrote at the bottom of it, don't be afraid to fill it out. Because the bank of heaven will recognize it if he goes through the Pentecostal clearing house. That's right. See if you got something here on the top of yourself. And if you're recognized. If you've got identification to show that the check belongs to you, it's only for believers now. If you've got that identification, my God will recognize your check. That's right. No matter what you ask for, any redemptive blessing belongs to you. Now I spoke to you at length, and I know your limbs are cramping, you elderly people and young and all standing inside, outside, around the doors. God rewards you richly. I'm your brother. There isn't, I haven't got one speck of healing power. Nobody else has got it. There's not a doctor got any. No medicine's got any. There's not a medicine in the world that'll heal you. There's not a doctor that's in his right mind will tell you that. My old brother said they don't have a medicine to heal. If I cut my hand with a knife, they haven't got a medicine in the world to heal that knife cut. Any medicine to heal a knife cut my hand would heal it on the desk during my coat. You say medicine wasn't made for your desk or uh, uh, the coat. It's made for your body. Well, what if I cut my hand and I fall down dead? And you embalm me and make me look natural for 50 years. Give me a shot of penicillin every day and all kinds of salves and sew up and everything else. 50 years from the day, the cut looks just like it was when it was cut. If it heals the human body, why don't it heal it? Well, you say, sure, life's gone out of it. Well, tell me what life is and I'll tell you who God is. See? That's right. It's God. Medicine does not build tissue. It takes life to build tissue. That's right. And your attitude towards God is what does it. Someone said to me, what about penicillin for a bad cold? I said, like having a house full of rats. And you put out rat parts and kill them. It don't patch up the hole. It only kills the rats. That's right. And that's, it kills the germ. That's true. Medicine might kill a germ, but it don't build the cells that the germ tore down. That takes God to do that in him alone. I'm the Lord who heals all thy diseases. What if you broke your arm and said, Doctor, heal my arm. I'm cranking, working on the car. You want to finish up. You say you need mental healing, and that'd be right. He might set your arm, but God has to produce the calcium and the uh, life matters and things to heal it together. It takes God. We have nothing that'll heal. No medicine heals. God heals. And your attitude towards God, the one that does the healing, and we can't figure out yet what the life is. We know the mucus the life comes in, but we don't know what the germ of life is because it's a spirit, and there's no glass can see a spirit. Very God. So... That's the one that does the healing. Will you believe on him tonight? If he will come in the audience tonight, just a little group, we'll call somebody up here, I think. They would give out a bunch of cards last night. One to a hundred, I believe, in A. We've got a few of them. We had to hurry. But tonight, if we'll just call some people out here and let the Holy Spirit begin to move here, to if he will. I don't say he will. And then if he'll go out into the audience, and begin to move out into the audience and do the very same thing. Out there, you without prayer cards, as he does here with prayer cards, you just touch his garment and see if he isn't, if he isn't the same high priest. How many would believe it? If you'd see what I've talked about tonight come to pass, raise up your hands all over the building with I'll bow your head. 
our Heavenly Father, this is as far as any man could go, would be explaining the Word. Now faith cometh by hearing, and hearing of the Word. Here lays people on cots, stretchers, wheelchairs. There's some out there that's dying with heart trouble, cancer. No doubt, but there's all kinds of diseases in here. Father God, there's maybe unbelievers sitting close. There may be unconverted sitting close. If they are, Father, if they see your presence move down to prove that you are you're the God who made the promises in the midst of us, surely if you do that much, we'll believe the redemptive story that you did die for our transgressions and for your stripes we were here. Granted, Lord, I commit myself, this audience, all into your hands. And Father God, I love you for your word. I love this wonderful audience of people who's listened attentively. They stood cramping their legs are stiff and sore. But hear me, Lord, please. When this crowd leaves this fairground tonight and starts back to their home, Lord, one day after you had been crucified and buried, they thought it was all over. You were dead and buried and that was all. There were two men, Theophius and his friend, was on the road down to Emmaus. Somebody walked with them all day long, speaking to them about the Word of God. They didn't recognize who it was. But when he got them that night, he got them inside the building and closed the door. He did something before them, just like he did before he was crucified. They recognized it, because no one else did it that way. They knew that it was him. And quickly he vanished out of his sight. Behind the curtain, someone was gone. Light foolish, light hearted, they run back to tell the rest of the disciples, indeed, the Lord is risen. Will you tonight do the same thing, Lord? Will you come in our midst and perform and do just as you did before you were crucified that this audience might know that you are their God and their Savior, and you've been the one that fed them and blessed them? And maybe they realize if you'll do something like you did before your crucifixion, they know that you're not dead, but you're alive forevermore, as the scripture says you are, the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you do that, Lord, we'll all return home, saying like they did. Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the way? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Surely God will help us tonight with an audience like this stand patiently. There's a car across the street, 60 Oldsmobile, color maroon, license number TXM595, right across the street in the parking lot that's got a further block. And he has to get out right now. He was due at work in Vice City at 9 o'clock. You that have that car, would you please go let this brother out that he might report to work. Now again, that's a 60 mile Oldsmobile, maroon in color, license tag TXM 595 across the street. Would you move it for him, please? Thank you. Thank you, yes, brother. All right, that's fine. If you'll be so kind, I see someone going now, so I guess the brother will be out. All right. Thank you. I helped you so long tonight. But I'm, I'm only trying to... Uh, see, if you just jump in not knowing what you're doing, then what good does it do? See? But you, I, I want to get you to a spot to where you can see that it's the Scripture. It's the fulfilling of the Scripture. Now, last night we touched the subject where he was, Messiah was to appear in the body of believers in this last day to perform and do the same thing he did then. Now, I believe we... What is, we started the number one last time called a bunch of uh, We called just a few out of, from number one. We just keep calling around among them until we get them all up here. Let's start tonight somewhere else. Each time we told you, we, I told the minister brothers that we'd start from somewhere each night from the same, same car. Somewhere each night. Let's start, uh, let's say from 80, that'd be 80 and see if we can, how many could we stand here? We could stand about 15 or 20 people perhaps. 
Who has prayer card 80? Raise up your hand. Prayer card. And you want Jesus to heal you, raise up your hand. All who don't have a prayer card. All right. Now, all the, the others are on them up. I'll, 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 just remember, that prayer card has got one thing to do with it. How many have ever been to meeting before and know that's true? Raise your hands. Sure, that's got one thing to do with it. Not one thing. Now, you sit out there and have you got a prayer card. You just pray and say, uh, Brother Brandon doesn't know me. Lord, he told me a while ago that you were a high priest that could be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. Now, I'm going to touch you. I'm forgetting about Brother Brandon Stanley. But I'm going to touch you. My faith looks to be, Lord. I want to touch you. Now, don't get hysterically about it. Nothing will happen. Just calm me. Just calm and say, Just say, Lord, let me touch you. And say, so that's how do I know that you, that I touched you. You have Brother Brandon turn around and tell me. It's like, you did, when a woman touched you through your son, Jesus. Brother Brandon, and that minister that, or your adopted son, see? But they're taking the son's place while he's up there making intercession as a high priest. He's our elder brother. Did you know that? Sure. And we're, we're God's children too by adoption by him. Now, if everyone just won't move for a few minutes now, just be real quiet for a few minutes. Believe with all your heart. All right? Now, how many in the building is strangers to me? I, you know what? I don't know a thing about you. Raise up your hand. The entire army. There's not one person that I can see in this building that I know except my... Uh, I see my friend Ralph Evans here a while ago from Georgia sitting back up here. Wait, back here, that's it. He and his wife and Brother Fred Stockman and, and one of the trustees of my church, Jerry Grill, sitting right back out here somewhere. And Brother Sister Simpson sitting by him. That's the only people in this building I know outside of Brother Borders. Brother Gene Gold right here. And, well, my son was here, but he isn't here now. But that's all I know. Thank you. Now, now, if I do not know you, I would ask you this question. I would take their time, because if you ever want to get it in here, something's going to happen. Now, if Jesus... Lord, this is the same yesterday day and Does the Bible say that to Amen? All right. Now, how many know that He has already redeemed you from sickness and and death? Say Amen. Well, He couldn't redeem you again, He couldn't. Now, if He's standing here Himself, He couldn't do one more thing about it than He could run through you and I. He that receives me, receives Him the sent He that receives you, receives me. Is that right? He that receives me, receives Him the sent now, if you just receive the Holy Spirit, the message of it, now quote it, you the Bible. See? Just tell me what he did and what he promised. And a little drama for the little children, because I think this little thing sitting here and many other there, little some sucker babies sitting there and watching my heart burning for them and everything else. Now, now if, if this God who made the Bible, who wrote the Bible, you believe God inspired? The Bible is inspired God's Word. Do you believe it? You believe it with all your heart. All right? It's God's inspired Word. Then if it's God's inspired Word, then if the inspiration of God is here with us to make this Word live the fruit that He's here, surely you can receive Him. Is that right? Now, now, I want to know you in this prayer line, every one of you that's strangers to me, and I don't know anything about you, raise up your hand. Now, it's all strange. Everybody's strange. Now, remember, I am not a healer, and no other man is a healer. God is a healer. That's right. Now, Jesus is standing here now tonight, because I said to this suit on that he gave me, and if he wanted to declare himself, how would you know it was him? He'd act the same way he did when he was here on earth. Is that right? He'd do the same thing. Then you would know then if he was the Messiah. I'm not the Messiah. No other man's the Messiah. He is the Messiah. But his spirit dwells in us. See? It's not us or not. For now, it's just like his woman. Is this the woman? Did you say what this is? All right. Now, I don't know the woman. Never seen her in my life. She raised her hand a few minutes ago that neither one of us knows each other. Here's my hand, Bible hand open here. I don't know her. I've never seen her. You don't know me. Here we are, strangers. Now, now, 
And here's a very beautiful picture of St. John 4. Here's a panorama, like the well, that out of the public well of Samaria. Now, uh, every person in here be ready to receive it. And this, this would spell it right here. You be ready. You be ready. You, you. All down here, just be ready. See? Because if you can see him come in and do exactly that, that shows that he's not dead, he's alive, you're watching his word. And your little bar's all tossed around. See? Then believe me. Just accept it. Don't be afraid. He said, it's I. Be not afraid. I remember that. Be not afraid. It's I. Don't be afraid to take him at his word. I believe you, Lord. I'll get well. Just do that. Be not afraid. It's I. Now listen. If this woman and I are perfect strangers and have never seen one another, if I am anointed with the Holy Spirit and to tell her something in her life, like Jesus did the woman at the well, whatever it might be in her life, we've never seen one another, it has to come through some spiritual power. Is that right? We know that. It would be a miracle. How many know that? A miracle, some can't be solved that. All right? Then, if it would take place, how many of you would believe it was... The Christ, the Holy Ghost, the same as one. All right, then just receive it. But it's her and I together, never seen one another in our lives. Now, for the glory of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I take every spirit in here under my control. For the glory of God. Now, be reverent, be in prayer. Quiet, the Lord. Now, lady, I want to speak to you just as. Jesus did to the woman. Now, you might be here for sickness. You might be here for somebody else. You might, I don't know. So you might be finance. I, I hear this woman standing here. That's the same way that the woman met our law. Now, and he talked to her a little while. Now, you have to take my word for this. I couldn't prove this for the scripture. But he had deeds go by Samaria. And he said he did that until the fire was showed him. So it must have been this way. He the Father sent him up to Samaria. All right? All that he knew was up Samaria. He thought he'd get alone, so he just sent the disciples away. He waited. A woman come up, so that might be the one. So he sat there and began to talk to her. What was he doing? Contacting her spirit. Now, if he went down there and said, I am the Messiah, I, I am the Messiah, it'd be better for her to tell him. See? Let him declare himself to this woman. God works in mysterious ways. And he told that woman something was in her life. Well, she said, you must be a prophet. I know when the Messiah comes to he'll tell us this. She said, he'll do anything. Jesus said, I'm he. And I promise the same word, especially in this age. Now, if, if you were sick, and I said, I have a gift of divine healing. A gift of divine healing is just a faith in divine healing. That's all it is. That's faith. Everybody has faith in divine healing as a gift of divine healing. Because that's all it is. Now, that don't make them a divine healer no more. It makes the man who believes in salvation a, a divine savior. See, it just he believes in it. I believe in it too. But I'm not a gifted person like uh, some of the men, like Jack Cole and many of them really are just real. I guess they got deals with them in their way, and Brother Roberts in his way, and, and me with my way. We just got ministry, that's all. God set in the church, apostles, apostles. Preachers, dancers, pastors, all, and then nine spiritual gifts in the church. I said, Brother Dan, why are you trying to do that? I'm trying to contact your spirit. Jesus sent me to this city. I was laid here. Now here's the woman. About, I had a number on a prayer card. Way up in the, I forget where it called, 50 or 75 or somewhere around. Well, that's where it was. You just had to be that woman sent me. All right? Now, not knowing one another, now, what am I trying to do? Contact your spirit. And if the Lord God, if I said I had a gift of healing, lay my hands on it and say, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You're going to get well. That'd be all right. You don't believe it, you get well. I believe it. God will honor your faith. But what if he comes and tells you something that you, that you have been, that tells you what you will be? You know whether what it has been, whether it's the truth or not. Something that you have done in your life, way back or, or whatever he does, or something on that order then it would make the same Messiah. The audience wouldn't think it. They'd believe it. And this is set. I may be granted. Now if the audience can still hear my voice, 
That pillow of fire that you see on the picture is standing right between me and the woman. I see her, she's moving away. She looks years younger than what she does in person standing close to me. She's moved back to, she's had some sort of an operation. And that was on her throat. It was a garden. Is that, is that right? Raise up your hand. All right, now, you believe with all your heart? Now, let's just talk to the woman just a little bit longer. See? Just a little longer. See, so you, the people think she gets it. See what else you say. Yes? I see her now, again. It's a surgery on the throat. That's been quite a while ago. And the thing's come back again. You got it again. That is right. But see, he's hidden from the doctor, but he can't hide from God. God knows right where he's at. It's a lie, the multiplication of cells growing. Mother. The fact you was a real baby in the womb of your mother growing. So this has no form, it's just spreading out. The devil. Choking spirit. And a trying. She might know. There's such a woman sitting right there. So trouble too. That's right. What did you touch? I don't know you do that. Never seen you in my life. So that's what you're suffering with. See, I can feel like it's one spirit calling the other and I get for help. See, like that. It's crossed up. Okay. It's the Holy Spirit telling who you are. Would it help you? Would it help you out of you? Miss Harrison, you can go home and be well. <laughs> Yes, 
just one little lady. I don't know. But God will reveal to me what you're here for. You believe me to be a prophet in the If you will. The hernia had some trouble having such a surgery operation behind the intestinal line. Cancer now has come to hernia. That's true. You believe in he healed you? Thank God. Another thing, you're not a Christian, you're a sinner. 
Will you accept him as your Savior? For your soul? If God, when the apostle Peter came, he was a sinner too. If God can reveal me your name and tell me your name like you did the apostle Peter, will you believe that it's the Christ of God who loves you and saves you now? You'll take my word that your sins are forgiven? You will. Mr. Davidson? And you go home and get well. Have faith in God. I keep feeling something coming out there from somewhere. You think I'm reading your mind. I know. Here. Just touch my hand, lady. If I will look this way and tell you what's your trouble, you'll know whether it's right or not. Is that right? Then your cancer will leave if you'll believe it. Will you believe it? Raise up your hand that's so. And go. Come, lady. Will you believe, lady? If God will reveal to me, looking this way, what's your trouble? Do you believe me to be his prophet or his servant? Do you believe to be his? Thank you. Then go eat your supper. That's stomach condition too much. <laughs> if I tell you before the lady comes, she had the same thing. She's got a nervous stomach. You've had it for a long time. Go eat. <laughs> you need your back up and let you sit in. Well, then go straight to God. God is all God. Just come in. Heart trouble. God to heal our heart trouble. God heals our heart too. Do you know that? You believe God can use your ass and make you well? Go rejoice. You believe God can use your ass and make you well? Keep going. If that other lady was healed with ass and a young girl like you would be healed with it. You wonder what I'm talking about you, wasn't it? 
You just want me to come back. Now, if you just bring me another lady of your hand.
passare l'impulsa di un'altra ora di emergenza in Iran.